Um, does anybody have, has anybody made any resolutions for New Year's? Good, because throw them away. <laughs> throw them completely away because you can't do them unless you have a proper perspective. It's absolutely impossible to do them. And there's really only one perspective and one thing that you need to do. And we're going to talk about that today. But in order to do the thing that we need to do for the Lord, we need to have a proper perspective upon Him. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So before I get into it, I'd like you all to stand while I read God's Word, and then we'll pray. This is from Isaiah chapter 6. This is verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seating, sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out. While the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Keep on listen. He said, Go tell the people, tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, How, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning. Like a terebinth or an oak, whose stumps, whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you are in your character, not by what we make of you, but by who you are in your person. Lord, we ask that as we study and look and to see this vision of who you are, that we all here would have a proper view of you. We would have a proper view of ourselves, and we would understand why it is we do things for you because of that. Lord, I pray that you might change us by your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I saw it up there at the corner of my eye earlier. Okay, so the back one doesn't work? Okay. Well, so I might be turning around a little bit because I I thought it was going to work, but that's okay. Um, All right, so let's look at it here. Um, some of you may have thought that I was going to share a little bit about Galt. I'm not going to. I came here to preach the word, and that's what we're going to do. So just if you want to ask questions about Galt, you can ask me later, but that's not why I'm here. So in the year of King Uzziah's death. So his death was about 742 B.C., about 20 years or so before the northern kingdom is exiled. So there's still some time, if you will. This is when Isaiah starts his ministry. This is his calling. This is where he starts it. But here, Uzziah, he, was, he started out as a decent king. He did some, some good, and then pride got the better of him, took him over, and he started to do some things that weren't right. And God struck him with some diseases, and he died. So at this point in time, there's no king. You have to have that in, there, in your mind. Isaiah is a person who worked in the temple. He had some royal blood, and he worked in the temple. He would have known what a king looked like. He would have been active with the king and would have seen a throne room. But now the king is dead. Uzziah is dead. This is the time frame. This is where he stands when he gets this vision. Good, it is up there. Yay. All right. So 
Isaiah, as he's in the temple, he saw. This is literally a vision. He saw this as he's there working, standing in the temple. What does he see? He sees the Lord sitting on a throne. He sees a kingly God. Fit this in with what we're talking about. The king is dead. And Isaiah gets a vision of a king, a real king, sitting on a real throne. That's who we're talking about. The real God of the universe. The real king. He is on a throne. And he sees it. He knows what a throne room looks like. He's not mistaking anything. Some of us might, but he is not. He sees him sitting on a throne. Lofty and exalted. Imagine steps like this. In your mind, you might imagine a floor, just a flat floor in a throne room. But then the throne is up on top, above the rest, above stairs, above the other people, higher than them. That is the throne. That is where it is. It is high and above all those that are around him. Other than how he wants it to be, there is no head above his head. He is the highest there. It is his throne room. As Isaiah stands in the temple, he sees this with his lost of his king. <clears throat> no, not, not quite yet. With the train of his robe filling the temple. That's the part I love. We talk about it being a train. We think of usually the train maybe of, of a, um, a lady's um, wedding gown or the train of a, of a king's robe that goes back. But I want to share the real word with you because it hit me a little different than we're used to hearing, I think. The literal, word, the literal word is hem. It's the hem of his robe. What's a hem? This is my hem on my pants. The hem. He's standing in the temple, right? Imagine this. If you want to close your eyes, please do. He's standing in the temple of God. He has been allowed to see through into the throne room. He sees God sitting on a throne that is high and lifted up. At the same time, he sees, probably blue or purple in nature, a robe. Which the hem is so large that it not only fills where he sees, but it is filling the temple that Isaiah is standing in. It has gone so far out and around in a way that the temple... If you can imagine my pants, <laughs> the hem is so wide that it has stretched out to fill this whole room. Just the hem. Just the hem. I love it because it's a small part of what he's wearing. It's just an area that is sewn up to be finished. And it is what is flowing out far and away. And it is glorious and it is, I'm certain, in a color Isaiah would see as being royalty, which would be blue or purple. Expensive things. I looked for an image to show this to you today, but I could only find black and white. And I felt that it did not do justice to the throne room scene of God. Because it did not show the royal color that would have been in his robe that he was wearing. So his hem has gone out. And around to fill the whole temple of God. Just the hem. I cannot get past that because we haven't even got to any glory of who God is character wise. We're still talking about the stuff he's sitting on and what he's wearing. And yet that is amazing. Amazing. Verse 2. Seraphim stood above him. Seraphim. You know what seraphim are? They are burning ones. They are on fire, literally. They are on fire. You have to put this in your mind. You've got to imagine this scene the best that you can. Here is, now mind you, God is a spirit. You are not literally seeing his face. Notice that through this whole passage, God's physical features, arms, noses, ear, ears, I said noses, noses one, ears or two, you don't see him. But yet Isaiah knows and he sees this throne this chair, lifted up with the hem of his robe all over the place, and there are burning beings with six wings flying around. They're on fire. They're supposed to be. It's not an accident. They were created that way. 
They are literally on fire. And what are they doing? They stood above him. They either stood, like it says, that could also be translated as flown above. In either case, their heads, their voices, their speech is up above and around the throne. They have six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. So they're here. I can't do it. They're here, and they're covering his feet. What's the posture that these burning ones are taking? It's a posture of humility. They are covering themselves in the presence of the Almighty God. And these are seraphim. Some people could say that, you know, they're, <clears throat> that they're in a higher position than us. Some people could say that. I don't believe that's the case. I believe God has put us in a place that will be higher than them. We are the crowning achievement of his creation. But in the way they look, and they are humbled by God. They are humbled by him. And with two they flew. In your mind, put this again. You have the throne of God lifted up upon stairs with the hem of her robe filling not only where, he, where the throne is, but the temple that Isaiah is standing in. And the burning ones are flying around him, covering their feet and their face. That is the scene that we are seeing through Isaiah. Verse 3. Okay, Daniel. And one called out to another. I'm not going to be able to do it. I could yell, and it might give some good effect, but it will not be what is happening here. But it is serious. It is holy, holy, holy. That's about as much as I can give you. But I didn't shake anything, did I? I probably didn't even shake your heart even a little bit. But that's what they say. Holy, holy, holy. This is something... People have talked about this as meaning, you know, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But in Hebrew, this is different. This is, if you can't, Hebrew doesn't have a word to say that something is the most of the most of the most. This is the best way Hebrew can do it. It's not just holy. It's holy, holy. It's not just holy, holy. It's holy, holy, holy. It is the holiest. It is the highest holiest that it can get. There is no other holy than this. You can't find it. It exists nowhere than here. And this burning one proclaims that that is true. And he says it. It's interesting how it says it here. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, or is the Lord of hosts. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm way too excited. Is the Lord of hosts. Is the Lord of hosts. You know, anybody know what that means? The Lord of heaven's armies. We forget that. We just put hosts in there because it sounds neat. But we can't, we can't stay there. We've got to understand what the word means. It's the Lord of heaven's armies. There's an army that God controls. It's a powerful army. He is the Lord of it. There is no other. He is the most holy. And he is the Lord of heaven's armies. Not an earthly army, but heaven's armies. And the whole earth is full of his glory. Underline the word is there because in Hebrew, sometimes the verb is... It's just not there. It doesn't need to be. It's a different language than we have. So for our English, we have to add it. In context of the way it's being spoken, it would be more accurate to say, the whole earth will be full of his glory. Because right now, there's sin here. There's problems here. There's difficulties. But that is not the way it's always going to be. There will be a day when everything will be full of his glory. Everything. And it will happen. It doesn't matter what people think. In one way, I could say like this. You could put is in there. You know why you could put is? Because what God does is so foregone conclusion to happen that it might as well be already the case. That's the only way I could see in English putting the word is there. Because it will be full of his glory. It will happen, period. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. Close your eyes if you will, if you can, if you want to. I'm going to do it again, best that I can remember. He sees a throne. It's high. It's lifted up. 
There's the hem of a blue robe filling everything that is around you, the building that you're in. There are burning beings flying, covering their face and their feet. And then they call out one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. And it is so loud that the things that are around you are shaking by the mere volume of his voice. He hasn't done, these seraphs, these burning ones, haven't done anything else but spoken truth about who God is. And their voice carries so much power at the very thresholds of what you're in shake. This is the scene. And we're still not done. While the temple was filling with smoke. Now smoke was used in the temple of God, number one, to show the presence that he was there. They used to do this. They would go in and they would light incense before they would enter the most holy place. And the incense would go and it would basically fill in the most holy place. It would not only show that the presence of God was there, but it would protect the one who was going to minister before the Lord from the sight of God. Isaiah is in the presence of God. And he's being protected and allowed to see what he's seeing. But he is in God's presence. Next verse, please. This is where it's at. How do we react? This is how Isaiah reacts. Then he said, woe is me, for I am ruined. That's a pretty big statement. I have just seen, this is, this is what this means. Woe is a word of distress. I am completely in distress in myself. I do not know what to do with myself. And I know that by what I have seen, I should be destroyed. I am ruined. That's his reaction to the utter awesomeness and holiness of God. It's how he reacts. And he says, because, because I am a man of unclean lips. Unclean lips. You know that out of the heart comes the things that you say. When he says he's unclean lips, his realization is that he, he knows in his heart he, he is unholy. He is not holy, holy, holy. If you could, if it was positive, or if it was possible, you could do negative holy, negative holy, negative holy. He would be the opposite of what God proclaims himself to be. And he knows that. He also, in his wonderful pastoral heart, says that I'm not on my own here, but I care for my people. And he says, and I live among a people of unclean lips, to where I know what is in their heart because it comes out of their mouth. For my eyes have seen the king. I love this because it's always good to have things in context with time. The king of Israel has died. And a royal family member has been allowed to see the real king. He's not a king of some earthly army, but he's the king of heaven's army. It's interesting how God says, you know what? You might have lost this. But you have not lost this. I am still on my throne. I'm still high and lifted up. I still have a robe, the hem of which fills buildings. And I have burning beings flying around me telling others that I am the highest and most holy thing that exists. And it shakes thresholds. Which you could say in our, in our day and age, the way that we might use that word would be a hinge of a door. The Lord of hosts. So verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand. It's interesting. So the burning one, who's already on fire, he goes to get a burning coal which he had taken from the altar with the tongs. In my mind, maybe it's because I do some, I try and pretend to do blacksmith work. Um, I have an anvil and I, I heat things up and I make things out of it. It's kind of fun. It's just fun to pound on things. And um, Stuff gets hot. When it's glowing, you don't want to be anywhere near it. One time I accidentally uh, dropped a little, well, 
I cut a little portion of metal off of another piece of metal. Um, I have a thing called the, it's, um, it's funny, it's called the anvil devil. It just has a very sharp point like this, and you put the metal over it, and you hit the hammer right where that point is, and it basically cuts the hot metal in half. Well, one of the hot pieces of metal fell on the concrete. I didn't think anything about it. Go about my stuff working around. That little piece of, it burnt the concrete. It burnt it. In my mind, as I think about this, we realize that there's a burning one, there's a seraphim, who's on fire. He has to get some tongs to reach down and get this coal out of the altar. Which, based on some other information we get from like Ezekiel and other visions of the throne room, most scholars believe it's from the coals that are burning underneath the throne seat. So it's from the very seat of God, one might say. It's from him. So what does he do with this? Let's move on. He touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. In the midst of realizing that he is in a place he should not be, that he is a sinful-hearted person in the throne room of a holy God, a seraphim goes out and touches him with a coal and says that because I have done this thing, which obviously was asked to be done by God, seraphim don't do anything on their own. They are messengers and workers of God, period. So he does this because God designed to be this way. So he takes away his iniquity and his sin. Those are different words. There's two things that happen here because of God's grace on Isaiah. One is the literal sinful heart that is in him, the sins that, have, that can keep him down, the sins that separate him from God, the sins that make it so he should leave. Imagine this scene. The sins that make it so he should turn around and walk away. Those are gone. You know what else is gone? The guilt. That's what iniquity is. It's the guilt that sin brings. So not only is he free to stay there, but he's free to not feel guilty anymore. You can be here, and you know what? It's okay, because I told you it was. I decided, and I use this coal, not because there's magic properties in here, but it's the way I help you understand that I've done something. So that you see that something has happened, Isaiah. So you see it. And you trust that it's real. And then you stay. Isn't that amazing? God shows him the vision. He basically shows him that I'm more holy than you and you should be scared. And he says, no, wait a second. I want you to stay. I, it's pretty amazing that God would allow that to happen. And God does the thing that is necessary to allow him to stay, which is to remove the problem of the sin in Isaiah's life. Now, don't miss me here. We're going to talk about us in a while, but we got to go see what Isaiah goes through first. So, let's continue. This will be a little bit faster as we move through some other sections. Oh, not quite, Daniel. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. I think it's amazing. The only two words out of Isaiah's mouth are, Whoa! I should be destroyed and here am I, send me. That's all he says at this point. There's nothing else. But the Lord says to him, who, who will go for us? For all of God. The us, New American Standard is very nice to us, and it, it kind of helps us with interpretation, and the us is capitalized. Do you see that? That's an interpretive help from the New American Standard um, that shows that they believe this us is talking about God and his fullness. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All of God. Who will go for us? Who will go for the Godhead? And he says that he will. Here I am. I'm the one. I'm here. I'm here. Send me. I'll go. He doesn't even know what he's going for yet. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know if it's going to work. He doesn't know anything. But notice that the effect that the vision of who God is has affected him so much. And the grace that God has given him with the coal has made him say yes to anything. Whatever you want. I don't care what it is. Because of what you are, I just want to go do something. I want to be here for you because of what you are, because of who you are. That's an effect. That's why I put on the title there, the effect of holiness. His holiness, his awesomeness should really affect your life. 
If it doesn't, you have an improper point of view on who God is. That's it. You don't see who he really is if it doesn't affect you. All right, let's move on, Daniel. So this is what God says to him. After he says, here I am, send me, God says this. Go and tell this people. Keep on listening. Go ahead, keep on listening. Open your ears as best you can, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render their hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. When he preaches the word of God, God already knows what's going to happen. He knows what the hearts of these people are like. And it's not going to change, and he knows it. And he sends Isaiah to do this. To preach in a way that they are going to be hardened. I'll explain that as I finish the whole thing, though. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. It's interesting. When God asks us to speak truth, when God asks Isaiah to speak truth, Isaiah has to speak truth, period. It's God's truth. He has to speak it. It has two effects. It hardens hearts by the nature of the truth, or it opens them by the nature of the truth. God does not change himself so that people can go, oh, that feels really good, and I'm more readily available to take that upon myself. God is who God is, and he must be accepted as who he is. And when God has Isaiah speak truth, and in it there is repentance, there is the ability, uh, ability to come to the Lord. But God's not going to speak it any softer or any less him to gain that. Because what would they be coming to? Would they be coming to God if he had Isaiah speak it? Now, Isaiah, tone down the truth a little bit. Because if you tone it down, this guy over here, he, he's going to accept that, that what? Toned down truth. Or, as one could say, it's non-truth. You can't do that. So he has them preach the truth. And the outcome is going to be that they're going to be ones that don't listen. It's interesting. So now we move on to the next verse. Then he said, Lord, how long? How long will I speak and nothing will happen? He's going to be a majestic failure, if you will, Isaiah. Uh, it's going to, I don't know how Isaiah based his life. Did he base his life on, if I have ten people come forward and accept the Lord, then I'm doing a good job? If I had a thousand, then I'm doing a good job? How did he base his life? Well, at first, before he knew what was he getting into, he realized that his life would be based on the holiness of God. How I saw him. And how he affected me. That was what Isaiah started with. Now it's like, hold on a second, how long will this be? And this is what the Lord says. And he answered, until cities are devastated. Devastated, utter destruction. And without inhabitants, nobody lives there. I know I'm kind of, you guys should know this thing, but sometimes we got to make sure we get it. Nobody will be living there. Houses are without people. They're just desolate. They're there, but nobody's living there. And the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. This is a picture of what happens to the land of Israel when both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah are exiled. It was barren. You know who was left? The poor people. The Babylonians and the Assyrians had a habit of bringing along people with them and moving them about the kingdom so they couldn't band together. Typically what they would do is bring the rich people with them back to where they were because it would limit their ability to cause a rising up. And they would leave the poor people because they have no ability to do anything about it. So when it gets to 722 and 586, when everything is said and done, you have a desolate land where only the poorest of the poor live, and they have no effect on anything, even their own lives. And this is because of their sins. God has chosen here that you know, I have to do something about what you've done. I have to. Because of who I am, I must do something about what you've done. And I'm going to do it. 
and I'm going to preach, have Isaiah preach that truth. And people are going to get mad at you, Isaiah, because you're preaching what I'm telling you to preach. Last verse. Yet there will be a tenth portion. We usually use the term remnant. There will be a tenth portion in it. And it will again be subject to burning. So when we look at these two sections now, there is a section of Israel who is exiled. Then some many, many years later, 722 to 586, 586, Judah is then exiled. So there will be again another time where God uses judgment upon his people. This will happen. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. Have you seen, I'm sure around here we have because we live up in the mountains. Have you gone out and seen an area where uh, loggers have just logged a whole area, clear cut? What do you see? Stumps. That's all you see. It's a mere shadow of the forest that existed, is it not? There's leftovers. You see that something once was here, something great. Great trees were here. It filled the sky. But now you see stumps. In those, it says the holy seed is its stump. Even though a small amount is left, there is still something that God is going to do with it. He brings them back. Ultimately, Israel comes back. And then through the ones that come back, through them, the Messiah is ultimately born. He keeps his promise throughout the whole time. But he still is holy and still must deal with it. So now that we've gone through Isaiah and seen what he has dealt with, I want to share with you what we need to do with it. Remember in the beginning I talked about resolutions and I said don't do them? You can't do them. Right? You know why? Because most of the time when we do them, we're focused on that issue. I don't care what you're trying to do or not to do. Especially as a believer, unless you have a correct perspective of God, you cannot proceed. It is understanding who God is that should affect how we act every single day day of our lives. It must be that way. If there's a lack of change, if there's a lack of understanding, it's because of a wrong perspective. This is about perspective today. And if you want to do this whole New Year thing, fine. I don't think it should be a New Year thing. I think it should be an everyday thing. You should have a perspective on God every day. You should understand this vision exists every day. Even though we see it at a point in time, and Isaiah saw it at a point in time, God is still sitting on a throne. He's high and lifted up, and his hem still is way bigger than you imagine. And burning beings are flying around saying, holy, 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 and the doors are shaking. That is happening, and it's happening right now. And it will never change. Because of our proper perspective of God, we understand our separation issue. I have a separation problem, if you will. That problem stems from sin. And just like with Isaiah, where God has to offer something by grace, so too God had to offer me something by grace. And he says, just like he said to Isaiah, the coal, he said, this is the way that I will take your sin and your iniquity away. This is the way. This is the way I have chosen. Does it matter whether you get it or not? I'm going to tell you that. Does it matter whether you understand that is this really the way it should be, God? It doesn't really make sense that you touch my lips to cleanse my heart with a hot coal. I don't get it. It doesn't matter. If God says this is the way he wants to save Isaiah, period. Now we, in our lives, we look at the fact that we have Jesus. He is the way that God has chosen to save humanity, period. He chose him from before time. He had him born in a human body, live a life, die a horrible death, to rise again, to ascend and offer a sacrifice to God for all time. And it's the only way because God says it's the only way whether you understand it or not. He's the one and he is the only one that we are saved by. Isaiah could have stood there in the throne room and said, I don't want that coal, I'm going to get this rock off the ground, isn't that good enough, it's not so hot. He'd have been like, well, if your sin's not forgiven, your iniquity isn't cast away. Because I didn't choose that. To do that for you. Like with Jesus. <laughs> I remember we were going through Hebrews. We've been going through Hebrews at Galt. And we got to the point where we're talking about Jesus going to the throne room. And how God chose Jesus to go to the throne room and offer his blood on the mercy seat. God chose Jesus. 
And I told him, I said, picture any other, um, we call them, even though Jesus isn't a religion, he's a relationship, but you look at other religions, I want you to picture some other person in your mind that leads that religion. You know, if they showed up at the mercy seat, God would be like, get out. I didn't ask you to be here. You're not good enough. Think of another person that's in charge of another religion. Get out. I did not choose you. You are not good enough. It's just Jesus. Just him. It doesn't matter who tries to do it. There's only one God will allow to do it. God allowed Jesus. So if we know that as Christians, if we know God is holy and I should be separate from him, but God has offered me grace and I accept Christ the way God has chosen to save me. And because of that, what should our statement be? Here I am, send me. I will share the truth. But let me ask you, at what cost? How do you gauge whether you are successful with God or not? It's a question we must ask ourselves. Because we're human. A lot of times we want to gauge our success based on numbers. Based on how good we think we are at a certain talent. You can put whatever else you want in there. That we tend to use to gauge success by results. That's what we do. But God does not say that that is what will be. The goal is to obey God, period, and be faithful, period. The results should never, ever, ever matter. Never. And if they do, then we have forgotten our perspective on the holy God of the universe. Because we are not here to make success. Who is the one who is successful? Jesus. He is the one who's successful. <laughs> we serve a successful God. I don't have to be successful. I just have to be faithful. That's all I have to be. Stop letting the world judge you on what you think you should do and what they think you should do. Focus on who he is and whether you're doing what he wants you to do. Who cares about the rest? I believe that if we, as believers, are faithful to what God asks us to do, there will be success. But, you may not even notice it. I'll share with you an example. Isaiah, he was a failure. Basically, the nation didn't turn around on a dime and run back to God and say yes, because they both were exiled and everything was desolate and they all were exiled. He, he failed. But, looking at it from this standpoint, when you come back and look at Isaiah, some of the most beautiful, wonderful statements about Jesus Christ are in his book. A lot of the ones we focus on for this season of Jesus are from his book. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know that he's the wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. We wouldn't know those things. His success happened much, much later. And we see that through him the Lord did work. But it was to open hearts who understood what God was doing. It was. So I don't even know what time it is. <clears throat> I don't know how long you guys go here normally. I know you guys usually go pretty darn long. It's because I've been here before. I used, to, I used to be here. At this point, I think I'm going to go ahead and let the Lord hit us hard and realize who he is. And I'd like John to come play and whoever else you've decided to come play while I finish up here. I'm going to say there's three types of, there's two types of imitations. One, I'm going to start with the Christians. We, as Christians, we forget who, who God is. Not what. Sometimes we make him a thing. He's not a thing, he's a person. Who is he? He is, as the seraphims say, he is holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. 
And his glory will fill the whole earth. That's who he is. When we understand who he is, the things that we worry about, the success we worry about, the results we worry about, and when I say those things, I mean within Christian service. Because that's sometimes what locks us in. Oh, I've been teaching over here, but nobody seems to listen. Who cares? Is that what God told you to do? Then be quiet. And just let God use you the way he wants to. Period. He's the one that does the working. He's the one that brings the people. He's the one that saves the souls. Just do what he tells you to do and stop worrying about whether you're successful or not. Success is in whether you're faithful or not. Have you been faithful to the Lord? If you can say yes, then you are successful in the eyes of God the Father, the King sitting on the throne with his hem filling the whole temple. You are successful because you are faithful to him. So to those Christians, I would say you need to check, <clears throat> check who you think God is and allow it to affect how you live your life. That's the major deal. Does it affect you and how you live? It needs to, otherwise you need to get a recharge of who he is. If you have come today and you're not a Christian, God is holy. He is completely different than us and sin is not around him. And when we realize who God is in his holiness, we should realize that we ultimately should be separated from him and he has all ability and it is okay for him to cast us off. But instead of doing that, he says, just like he did with Isaiah, don't go, I have Jesus for you, stay with me. I want you with me. I have chosen for you to be with me. And I have made a way for that to happen. And I know you didn't know that you were like that, but I did. And I made a way anyway, because I cared, period. And then there comes the final word, where if you're not a believer, you can say, here I am. Send me, make yours, save me with the way you've chosen to through Jesus Christ. Save me. That's all it takes. If you look at what Isaiah did, he stood there. I love it. He stood there while somebody else did all the work and brought the coal to him. We stand here while Jesus dies on a cross and allow him to do all the work. But then the hard part comes. Whereas you've heard non-believers talking to the Christians, sometimes we make mistakes and we don't look at God right. But for, the, for all of us, tough times come and we might, do, we might have to do something that is truth and people might not like it. But it doesn't matter. Because we know who we are in God. One last thing before I end. I want you to imagine yourself as Isaiah. And I want you to imagine the awesome holiness of God where you should be scared of being there. But I want you to realize and forget that scared feeling and realize that I'm supposed to be here. God has made it so I can be here. And I want to be here. At this point, I would ask that anybody like, we, like they typically do at Bell Road, anybody who wants to come up and Pray with those who might come and have questions. Please come down. I'm going to stand down here. And if there are those that either, if there was a resolution, the only resolution that could be made, I wouldn't even call it that. I'm just going to call it committing. I commit as a Christian to from now on seeing you properly, understand the presence of God. And as a non-believer, for the first time, I commit to Jesus Christ and the proper understanding of who he is. And all these people are here to hear that. And I would love to talk to anybody who wants to share any of those things with me. John. One friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to bear. One, a privilege to care 
responded there's only one thing that we can do when we hear the word of God it is to respond that's the only proper thing to do so as we finish I would pray I'm going to pray that that is what happens in your heart that there would be a response Lord we thank you again for who you are we thank you for how wonderful and awesome and holy you are Lord we thank you also for you loving us enough to want us to be with you and to make provision for that in your Son. Lord, we also ask that our lives would be spent as people that are faithful to you and that we would only gauge our life with you on how faithful we are to you. And the rest of what happens would be based only and solely upon what you do with us. Because we are just mere broken pots. Lord, I pray that there would be response among everybody here in some way to your awesomeness. I thank you for letting me come here and all these wonderful people. In Jesus' name, amen.